Uh, our next speaker is Don Gannam from uh, uh, University of California, San Francisco Medical School. He's gonna talk about Kaposi's sarcoma virus infections and the biology of Kaposi's sarcoma. Don. Okay, thank you so much, Arnie, for having me. This is my third time at the Institute. I've been here once every year for the past three years. This is kind of like a hajj for me. Um, uh, and the weather couldn't be better, so. Um, I'm gonna talk today about a tumor called Kaposi's sarcoma. It's actually really very, very unfortunate that the term sarcoma appears in the name of KS, because as I hope to show you, and as I think all the clinicians in the audience will know, uh, this is a tumor that's really at the cusp between the benign and the malignant. Yes, it's a bad thing to have. Uh, yes, it can be fatal uh, sometimes. Um, but if we, if we think of this using the traditional paradigms of, uh, of, of cancer pathogenesis, we're going to miss the opportunity to understand uh, the many different contributions that the virus makes to, uh, uh, to pathogenesis. So I'm going to talk today principally about the contributions of latent viral genes to uh, uh, to infection, and we'll start with a little bit about, a little primer about KS as a clinical entity. So this is Moritz Kaposi, a Hungarian dermatologist of the late 19th century who first described the HIV negative form of the disease, which we now call classical uh, KS. And uh, classical KS, uh, as it occurs in the endemic regions, which are the, the Mediterranean basin and, 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 and central and sub-Saharan Africa, uh, has a very indolent uh, presentation. So the disease usually occurs on the skin, for some reason, particularly the skin of the lower extremities. Um, and dermatologists have traditionally divided it into several stages uh, morphologically. Um, the earliest stage that the diagnosis can be made at is the so-called patch stage. And you can see, and the, the, I've selected three examples, not from the same patient, um, that all affect the ankle. Uh, uh, the earliest stage is called a patch lesion. This is a stage where the tumor isn't even a mass. Uh, it's just a flat lesion, and as you can see, uh, one thing already evident, that lesion is red to the naked eye, and the reason it is is because it's full of new blood vessels. This is a highly angiogenic uh, uh, lesion. What's not obvious here, uh, but is true in the light microscope, is if you biopsy this lesion, uh, yes, there are tumor cells, um, but there are equal numbers of inflammatory cells. Um, uh, so there's a very prominent uh, number of inflammatory cells, T cells, B cells, plasma cells, monocytes, macrophages, uh, that are in this lesion. And that the inflammatory and the angiogenic component of this is at least as evident as, uh, uh, and in fact, more evident really than, the, uh, than the, the tumorous element. Now as time goes by, the lesion gets denser, more uh, indurated, hard, firm, and it can get a little elevated. And you can see it's gone from being red to almost purple. Uh, that purplish discoloration is the, due to the extravasation of red cells from the highly abnormal vessels that are in this structure. Those then get uh, uh, phagocytized by macrophages, hemosiderin is uh, produced, heme breakdown causes that discoloration that looks like a bruise, and many KS patients think that the lesion began as a bruise that wouldn't heal. Um, it, of course, doesn't begin as a bruise, but it resembles that because of this, this feature. Um, and that illustrates, uh, the other thing is that these lesions are often sometimes swollen and reflects the fact that the uh, edema is a, a very prominent part of, of the lesion initially. Finally, though, if you wait long enough, uh, the lesion will form a mass, the so-called nodular phase. Uh, again, you can see the mass is deeply uh, uh, violaceous, um, and you can see several satellite masses around it, um, uh, and it's, of course, highly, highly vascular. So that's what the lesion looks like grossly, but I would need to emphasize one more thing about the lesion which is the classical KS uh, is a, a tumor that in general, people die with but not of. Um, this disease usually it remains localized to the skin. Now it can ulcerate and require excision or radiotherapy, but typically many patients require no therapy at all, live to a ripe old age and die of something else, okay? Uh, so classical KS is an indolent disease, and I'll come back to that. Now, of course, in this country, we got to know HIV because of its more, uh, we got to know KS because of its more malign presentation in AIDS, uh, in which you have a systemic immunodeficiency state. And under those circumstances, uh, there's widespread dissemination of, skin, uh, of KS on the skin. It can form huge confluent patches that become hugely discolored. Uh, you can see also many other lesions all over the torso. Uh, these lesions can ulcerate, uh, they can fungate. Uh, 
Uh, and all of this can require surgical excision or radiation therapy or chemotherapy uh, in, the, in the AIDS population. But even, the, uh, even these widespread disorders on the skin are usually not fatal. It's a cosmetic problem, it's a local problem. Um, but people don't die of cutaneous KS. What's important about the AIDS-related form is they can also involve the, the visceral structures, the lungs and the, and the GI tract, and pulmonary KS in particular is a form of, it, it can lead, often leads to respiratory failure and death. Okay. Now, so already uh, KS is unusual, um, uh, unusual in its appearance, but when you look in the light microscope, you start to see some of the really profound differences between KS and classical cancer. Classical cancer is histologically pretty boring. Uh, it's a clonal outgrowth of a single cell, single cell type, um, histologically monotonous. KS is, is the opposite. It's a very complicated lesion histologically. This is an early KS tumor of the skin. Here's the epidermis, as Peter showed you. The epidermis is completely uninvolved, the epithelium. This process goes on in the dermis, the connective tissue just underneath. All that red stuff are new blood vessels, aberrant new blood vessels with red cells inside. You can't see them too well, but the tumor cells here are wafting in and out of the uh, plane of the section. The tumor cells in KS are derived from the endothelium, cells that line blood vessels. <laughs> Every once in a while, the pathologist section will traverse um, uh, uh, the cells according to their long axis. I show you an example of that here. This is from KS in the gut. And you can see that here in this one plane, uh, you can see these very elongated spindle-shaped cells uh, that are in fact the, the so-called tumor cells of KS, uh, the spindle cells. This is the cell that comes to be the dominant form when the lesion is a mass or a nodule. Okay. But in addition, you can see already down here a lot of inflammatory cells in the lesion. Um, uh, uh, so that, that really KS, I think, is best thought of not as a, just a proliferative disease uh, or as a disease driven only by the proliferation of cells, but rather as a, a, as a, a, a triad of three things. There is proliferation, uh, ultimately, of these endothelial-derived spindle cells, um, uh, but these spindle cells are themselves unusual. Unlike uh, classical tumors, uh, these cells are usually diploid and almost never aneuploid. Um, and where clonality uh, assessments have been made of them, more often than not, they're polyclonal or oligoclonal and not clonal. There are examples of clonal KS lesions, uh, but they're uncommon. Um, and there are more examples of, of, of macroscopic KS that is, uh, that is polyclonal. The other thing that you're always taught about tumor cells is that they're supposed to have reduced dependence on exogenous growth factors. In the, in the tra traditional tumor virus uh, field, these kind of fibroblasts would be said to be uh, uh, to able to grow in low serum. That's not true of, of uh, KS spindle cells. Uh, for many years, one couldn't get them to grow at all in culture until Bob Gallo discovered that the trick was um, that you had to grow them in conditioned medium from activated T cells which is a cytokine and growth factor rich microenvironment. So if anything, they have an exaggerated dependence on, 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 uh, on, on environmental signals and growth factors. So it, there's this proliferative component, but already it's distinct from, from traditional cancer. There's a very prominent inflammatory component, especially early in the lesion. Um, and there's this gigantic uh, amount of uh, neovascularity. And, and I want to make a, a, a distinction here um, between the kind of angiogenesis that's going on in a KS tumor and classical tumor angiogenesis. Tumor angiogenesis in most tumors is a secondary phenomenon. As the tumor grows and outstrips its blood supply, its growth is arrested until something happens, a switch is thrown, and it can recruit uh, new blood vessels, the so-called angiogenic switch. Um, but that's not how KS begins, if you think back to that patch lesion. The, the angiogenesis and inflammation are happening even before there's a mass, before there's any suggestion of, a, a, of outgrowth of a blood supply. And I think that's an important distinction that people often fail to make. So I think it's important to think about these three components going on at the same time, um, that this isn't just a proliferative lesion. Okay, uh, so we've talked about a lot of this already, oligoclonality, genetic stability, lack of chromosomal changes. Uh, I want to discuss one other feature of KS that's quite remarkable, and that is uh, that KS has a particular relationship to inflammatory states that's quite remarkable. Um, some of you may remember that when we were taking care of AIDS patients in the 80s before there was uh, effective therapy, you would occasionally see AIDS patients who would come into the hospital with an opportunistic infection who had a small number of dermal KS lesions on their body. And if they survived that opportunistic infection, say pneumocystis pneumonia or cryptococcal meningitis, if they actually survived that infection and went home, it was not an uncommon occurrence. In the weeks after that survival event, 
uh, for their chaos, which had been stable for years, to floridly spread uh, in, a, in a fashion that was very dramatic and out of control. It wasn't routine for that to happen, but it was a fairly common occurrence. Suggesting that there was some relationship in vivo between an inflammatory state and the progression of KS. And a particularly remarkable example of that is the fact that KS, dermal KS, often occurs at sites of antecedent injury or inflammation, in particular surgical wounds. Uh, in classical KS, this was described as a person with dermal KS have an incision in the abdomen and have KS recur right at the surgical incision site. Here's an example from more recent times of somebody who had gingival surgery and six days after surgery, this guy had no prior oral KS, uh, developed KS at the suture line that required radiation therapy. So um, all of these things suggest that, that, that KS spindle cells are really unusual uh, uh, in their relationship to inflammation. Um, they require an inflammatory microenvironment to grow. Systemic inflammatory states or local inflammatory states are associated with recrudescences or worsening of KS uh, lesions. Um, and, at this, and once Gallo had developed methods for cultivating spindle cells, it became obvious that their, their behavior in vitro was also unusual. So they're not fully transformed. As we talked about, they have a very exaggerated dependence on growth factors. They don't grow in soft agar. They don't form tumors in nude mice, although they do, after in implantation into nude mice, during the 10 days when they're still surviving, provoke a lesion in the surrounding murine tissue uh, that has abnormal uh, leaky uh, new blood vessels. When the human cells in that implant die or degenerate, those blood vessels, go, which are of murine origin, go away. And that whole uh, set of experiments and, and, and all the clinical behavior of KS suggests that KS is a, is a disorder of paracrine signaling, uh, that spindle cells produce inflammatory and angiogenic factors uh, that recruit these inflammatory infiltrates and T cells and other cells in that infiltrate in return uh, provide uh, 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 survival and growth factors for spindle cells. So the whole thing is a complicated paracrine minuet that depends on, on these kinds of interactions. And um, uh, this is a working model. This, this is th th nothing I've said constitutes proof of this model, but this is the framework uh, in which we approach uh, the biology of, of KS. And I think when we start to dissect the individual contributions of the, of the KSHV genome to this process, we need to keep in mind that, that this isn't just a proliferative lesion. There's an angiogenic component and an inflammatory component, uh, and it's not necessary for the virus to make identical contributions to each one of these components in order to think about the progression of the intact lesion. Okay. So, uh, a primer about KSHV. Uh, this is a, a herpes virus of the lymphotropic uh, subfamily. Uh, its closest human relative is EBV, but it's highly diverged from EBV. Uh, it's the same size as the EBV genome. Uh, and like EBV, it can undergo either a latent infection or a lytic infection, as you learned about from Bill Sugden. In latency, uh, the genome persists in the nucleus as an episome, and many features of the KSHV episome uh, are shared with that of the EBV episome. Uh, uh, circularity, distribution to daughter cells, uh, dependence on a single viral gene product, in this case LANA, that functions much as EBNA1 does, and the instability of the latent state absent of selection. All of those things are features of the KSHV episome as well. For today's discussion, I want to emphasize that, that out of the hundred or so KSHV genes, only a handful of them are expressed during latency uh, and cells survive. I'm not going to talk much about the lytic infection today, so we're going to focus on the latent infection. Um, because most KS uh, cells, most spindle cells in a KS tumor are actually in the latency program. There are a small subset of cells that are in the lytic cycle, and we now believe those are an important subset that are doing important things in tumor genesis. Uh, I've long been an advocate uh, of the notion that the lytic cycle is very important in the progression of KS. It's a separate subject, though, and time won't allow me to talk about that today. So today we're going to talk about what, what lytic genes contribute. Uh, to, to the lesion, and in particular to the inflammatory aspects of the lesion. Okay, so uh, now it turns out that most, with one exception, all the, the genes expressed in latency uh, are located in this segment of the genome. Um, and if we blow that segment up, uh, uh, you can see that there are four open reading frames here. LANA is the EBNA1-like function involved in plasmid maintenance. There's a cyclin D homologue about which very little is known in vivo. Um, uh, and then there are two other proteins that I'm going to be talking about today, VFLIP and Kaposin, uh, which I'm going to talk about at some length. Um, in addition, the same region has a dozen pre-microRNAs, 
and those uh, microRNAs, those pre-microRNAs are processed into 17 mature microRNAs. So there are some pre-microRNAs that can donate either strand of the hairpin to risk. Our lab is very active in, in, in trying to figure out what these microRNAs are doing. Um, uh, and we know that they're involved in the, in the regulation of latency in both directions, facilitating the stability of latency and also exit from latency. Um, and we know some of the, their targets, but I don't have time to tell you any of that today because we don't know how to connect that yet in any direct fashion to tumor genesis. So I'm gonna to talk today about two, other, uh, two of these open reading frames. Um, but I wanna approach this in a certain context because our, th there is no animal model of KS, and as you well might imagine, given its histologic complexity, there's no cell culture model for KS either. So all of our thinking about how KSHV contributes to KS needs to be driven by the human biology and the clinical phenomena uh, that are observed. Um, so I wanna, I wanna say a little bit about what cell culture systems do exist um, and talk about their, what, what aspects of the, of the biology as we know it from medicine those systems do reproduce and what they don't reproduce. So we can establish latency in culture. In fact, the default pathway for KSHV infection in culture as it is for EBV is latency. And uh, in fact, we can infect just about any cell we want in culture with, with KSH, any human cell we want with KSHV. We can even infect murine cells with KSHV in culture and establish a latent infection. Um, we can't lytically reactivate very efficiently in murine cells. Um, and many human cells don't support efficient lytic reactivation either. Um, but the point is that, that many cells can be infected. And some cells will, will give you the full Monty, an efficient latent infection and efficient uh, lytic reactivation. 293 cells are an example of that. Um, many cells can do that. However, uh, there is absolutely no visible phenotype uh, that, uh, that attends latent KSHV infection in the vast majority of these cell lines. Okay. Um, including if you infect primary cells of many types with KSHV. Uh, in no case have we or anybody else reproducibly observed latency, uh, uh, a latent infection leading to immortalization. Uh, this is the opposite phenotype in, uh, uh, that EBV displays in B cells, which is powerful immortalization. And to this day, the only efficient way to make B cell lines in culture is to infect them with EBV. Um, in fact, uh, most cell lines that we infect with KSHV are not immortalized. In fact, I would, I would say all cell lines fail to be immortalized. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a, a strong growth phenotype in vitro. But there is a phenotype in one particular cell type, and that cell is the primary endothelial cell. So here's an example of an experiment of Claudia Grossman's um, uh, in which primary endothelial cells uh, uh, were either left uninfected or infected with KSHV and then uh, kept in growth medium for a couple of weeks. And you can see within a week, uh, within really a few days, you can start to see a shape change occurring in the cells such that by a week or two, uh, the entire culture uh, is elongated and spindle shaped. And this occurs only in endothelial cells. Um, no other cell type undergoes this kind of, uh, uh, of, of change. And Claudia was able to identify which viral gene in the latent, she showed that this uh, change was cell autonomous. If you took conditioned medium from these cells and put it on other cells, nothing happens to those cells. Uh, so the, the change requires the presence of the viral genome in the cell. Um, and so she asked if any individual viral gene could be responsible for this phenotype. And she did that uh, by making individual retrovirals vectors for each of the latent genes that I enumerated uh, before and, and, uh, it, and then asked whether uh, a spindle phenotype could happen in endothelial cells which were infected with these individual genes. And it's pretty obvious that one and only one gene was necessary for this phenotype and that is a gene called VFLIP, okay? A latent gene called VFLIP. So what is VFLIP? VFLIP is uh, a gene that activates the NF-kappa B signaling pathway. And uh, uh, so let's recap the NF-kappa B signaling pathway briefly. You know that N the transcription factor NF-kappa B is involved in controlling the program of a large number of, of genes that broadly speaking subserve two functions, pro-inflammatory functions and uh, anti-apoptotic functions in most cells. And NF-kappa B resides in the cytoplasm as an inactive dimer uh, because it's bound to an inhibitory subunit called I-kappa B that occludes its nuclear localization signals. But I that, that association is reversible. It can be reversed by phosphorylation of I-kappa B by a complicated kinase called IKK, I-kappa B kinase, um, which when it is phosphorylated at two serines in the N-terminus, uh, makes it a substrate uh, for the proteasome and liberates the active dimeric transcription factor that can go to the nucleus and turn on this pro-inflammatory 
and um, anti-apoptotic program. Well, it turns out that V-flip, uh-oh, there we go. Uh, V-flip um, uh, binds to the gamma subunit of IKK and uh, a, a, a complex that has now been characterized crystallographically uh, uh, by Mary Collins, Chris Boshoff, and their, and their crystallography colleagues in London. Um, and that complex triggers a conformational change uh, in NEMO or IKK gamma that activates uh, the alpha and beta subunits that contain the catalytic activity. So FLIP strongly turns on NF kappa B signaling. And here's an, a simple example of that, of taking an empty vector, a vector encoding FLIP, and transfecting it into cells with a reporter gene, a luciferase reporter driven by NF kappa B sites. And you can see a very substantial upregulation of NF kappa B signaling, which is linked to these pro-inflammatory and pro and anti-apoptotic programs. Um, so that's what FLIP does normally. There's nothing in the literature that says that, FLIP, th th that NF kappa B signaling uh, can produce a, uh, a cytoskeletal rearrangement. But I just showed you that FLIP, this pathway of FLIP activation is also linked to a very dramatic reactivation of the, of the actin cytoskeleton in primary endothelia. How does that come about? Does that require NF-kappa B signaling, or is that some other activity of FLIP? So in order to parse that, we took advantage of two, comp two ways of inhibiting the, the NF-kappa B signaling pathway. I'm going to dwell uh, on this one genetic trick, which is to make a, a non-phosphorylatable version of I-kappa B, um, that's in which both of those serines have been mutated. That produces a, a constitutive repressor of uh, or an I-kappa B super repressor, we call it, um, uh, that can no longer be subject to IKK control. And now we can do the following experiment. We can take UVEX cells and infect them with a, uh, with a, a retroviral vector expressing the I-kappa B super repressor, try to tie up all of the NF-kappa B in, the, in, in this unactivatable form, then infect with a FLIP retrovirus and see uh, if, if that blocks the, um, the spindling change. And the answer to that Oh, let's see, there's a little time delay now. Uh, okay, uh, is that it does block. So here's an example of normal uh, endothelial cells infected with the FLIP retrovirus, and you can see exuberant spindling, which is completely blocked uh, by blocking the uh, IKK, I-kappa B cascade uh, with the I-kappa B super repressor. So in fact, at least in endothelial cells, there is a phenotype uh, associated with NF-kappa B activation. Uh, is a pro-inflammatory phenotype with cytokine production in the medium, but also uh, a shape change. And that shape change is cell autonomous. The conditioned medium from these cells does not cause another cell to spindle. So with regard to this part of the story, uh, it's clear that FLIP expression um, uh, not only uh, activates a uh, NF-kappa B and therefore a pro-inflammatory signal, which is a paracrine phenomenon, but it also um, uh, produces a morphologic change by rearranging the actin cytoskeleton, which is uh, a cell autonomous phenomenon. Okay. So now I want, so there is at least, w so this is satisfying at one level. It says that, that not only is there a relationship between an inflammatory state and, and, and the tumor, but the virus that is etiologically involved has in its latency program at least one hardwired function whose dedicated purpose it is to turn on an inflammatory cascade and whose side effect is also a shape change that is uh, diagnostic of the tumor. Um, whether that shape change contributes something to, you know, important to the phenotype of the cell in vivo, we don't know, or if it's just a marker of NF-kappa B expression. That's, that's not decided. Now I want to emphasize that, that it turns out there's a second pro-inflammatory gene um, in the KSHV latency program, and this is a gene that we discovered about a decade ago. Uh, uh, by rooting around in KS tumors from patient biopsies looking for viral genes that were expressed. And, and this locus is called Kaposin. Kaposin's a funny gene because the original annotation only recognized a 60 amino acid open reading frame called ORF-K12. Um, it's a highly hydrophobic 60 amino acid segment. Uh, when we mapped the transcript for Kaposin, we discovered that there was a, another kilobase uh, upstream of it that was always represented in the transcript. And in that kilobase, there were two highly conserved sets of repeats of 23 nucleotides, GC-rich repeats of 23 nucleotides, called direct repeats 2 and 1. These were conserved in every isolate, although isolates differ in the numbers of repeats that they have. Um, in any given isolate, the number of repeats is stable. And uh, uh, I'll t make a long story short, uh, you know, computational biologists said that this was non-coding, uh, but we discovered in the late 90s that, in fact, these regions are expressed as proteins, and they're expressed from variant CUG codons, 
They can be expressed in, in all three different reading frames. Today I'm only going to talk about the products uh, which are called Kaposin's B and C. Um, I'm going to talk today only about Kaposin B, which is the product of open reading frame two, and, and basically goes from the, uh, it just represents the, the translation products of these repeats. Okay? Because these repeats are 23 uh, nucleotides back to back, they are translated into, 20, into repeats of 23 amino acids um, that are of two different sequences, both proline rich. Um, and that the small size and, 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 and simple composition of these repeats suggested that these weren't catalytic functions, but, but were more likely to be scaffolds or, uh, or some kind of adapter proteins in signaling. And that was uh, the working precept that, we, that governed our work for a while. It turns out that, that Kaposin expression is very injurious to a lot of cells. Uh, so it's been very difficult to see a phenotype by simply expressing, cells in expressing the gene in culture. That led us to a long series of uh, biochemical experiments looking for other proteins in the cells with which uh, these uh, uh, proteins, this protein might interact. That search has taken many forms, tap tagging and mass spectroscopy, uh, two hybrid screening. And in fact, we're still discovering new things that are linked to Kaposin. And in, what, in the time that remains to me, I want to tell you about several classes of proteins that we now know Kaposin can interact with. Uh, the first hint we got that was productive after many unproductive hits um, uh, was one that Craig McCormick, a, a postdoc in my lab, got a few years ago, um, in which uh, from a, an elaborate uh, two hybrid screen with the intact protein, he recovered uh, uh, the gene for a protein called MAP kinase associated protein kinase 2 or MK2. We actually liked this hit initially because it appeared to have something to do with signal transduction, but we recognized that our preconceived notions about Kaposin were not sufficient, um, you know, for us to get excited about it. So, uh, but that was one reason we decided to pay attention to this particular clone. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about what we've learned about MK2 and its relationship to Kaposin since then. First of all, the interaction between Kaposin and MK2 is real. Uh, we can see it by co-immunoprecipitation in, in, in infected cells or in transfected cells. But in fact, the interaction is, is not only real, it's direct. If we make recombinant Kaposin B uh, uh, fused to GST uh, in E. coli and purify that uh, and use purified recombinant MK2 uh, with a Hiss tag uh, also made from other E. coli and mix them together, uh, we can bring down uh, MK2 with the, on the GST Kaposin column. And this interaction actually maps to the N-terminal set of repeats, the DR2 repeats. We still don't know what the DR1 repeats do, although we do reproducibly observe that the interaction with DR2 alone is much less efficient than it is with the intact protein. So there may be some architectural contribution from DR1, but the binding is contributed by DR2. Now, what is MK2? Um, well, MK2, it turns out, is one of the principal substrates of a signaling pathway called the P38 MAP kinase signaling pathway. So this is a pathway that's designed to, sig to, to recognize inflammatory signals like those emanating from IL-1 and TNF. Uh, in culture, it also responds to other, other environmental stresses that are frequently associated with inflammation like oxidative stress from reactive oxygen intermediates. Um, um, and that triggers a cascade of cytoplasmic kinases uh, that converge on the MAP kinase P38. Um, and P38 has many cytoplasmic substrates, but it also, when phosphorylated, can enter the nucleus. And in the nucleus, its principal uh, uh, substrate is the kinase MK2. When that is phosphorylated, um, uh, so uh, it binds MK2 in the nucleus, phosphorylates MK2, and that leads to a conformational change of uh, MK2 that exposes its nuclear export signal, and the whole complex is exported back out to the cytoplasm where both kinases have additional targets. Okay, now I'm going to talk about some of those targets in a second, uh, but for the moment, I, would, I, I just want to emphasize that this is a signal that senses inflammatory states and leads to, uh, and leads to the export of MK2 from the nucleus. So one early clue that we were on the right path here was the discovery that uh, Kaposin B and MK2 co-localize in cells. In baseline state, they're both found in the nucleus, tightly so. If you apply an inflammatory signal like TNF-alpha or lipopolysaccharide, uh, you can see that, as, uh, as has been known for a long time, uh, uh, the nuclear form of MK2 also is exported to the cytoplasm, and you can see this clear cytoplasmic blush here. And the same is true of Kaposin B. Um, it is, in response to these inflammatory signals, it also is exported to the cytoplasm in a fashion exactly like 
what goes on in NK2, even though Kaposin B doesn't have either a nuclear import signal or a nuclear export signal. So that was a clue that, that this was the right thing. Uh, now, to say that Kaposin B binds a, a, a kinase is one thing. What does it do to the kinase? Does it inhibit that kinase or does it activate that kinase? And this is an immune complex kinase assay um, in which cells are either transfected with an empty vector or a vector expressing Kaposin B, and then we immunoprecipitate MK2 and give it a, a substrate in vitro. And you can see that Kaposin B expression is associated with upregulation of phosphorylation of that MK2 substrate. So Kaposin B binding is an activating event. But I want to emphasize one feature here. This is a very weak activator of MK2. I'll come back to that in a second. But compared to the things that people normally do in the lab, like osmotic shock or, uh, uh, or, or oxidative stress with uh, peroxide, uh, this is, uh, you know, th those typical laboratory stimuli are 30-fold more potent activators of MK2 than Kaposin is. So keep that in the back of your mind for a little bit. But it is an activator. All right, now how can we interpret that activation event? What does uh, cytoplasmic active MK2 actually do? Well, it probably does a lot of things, but there's one feature that's very important in this context, and it's only become clear in the last decade. When we were all in school, we were taught, and this is true, that cytokine and growth factor messages are very unstable. Bob Kamen discovered back in the early to mid-80s that they're unstable because they have AU-rich elements in their three prime UTRs, and if those were deleted, uh, MYC message, and now we know most cytokine messages become very, very stable. So cytokines and growth factors are often controlled at the level of messenger RNA stability, and that relates to these very degenerate AU-rich elements that are in the UTR. Okay. Uh, the new discovery uh, in the last decade is that that form of instability is not constitutive, it is regulated. And, it's reg and now we know that its principal regulator is MK2. That MK2 activation, and when, when active MK2 is delivered to the cytoplasm, among its targets are things uh, that are involved in this machinery of, of cytoplasmic RNA turnover for ARE-containing messages. Phosphorylation of that machine uh, inhibits this process, leads to the accumulation of cytokine messages, and as you might anticipate, uh, the enhanced accumulation of those messages leads to enhanced release of cytokines, including TNF, IL-6, IL-1, um, uh, so that in fact what this uh, pathway really is is a detection and amplification scheme from an inflammatory microenvironment, okay? Um, uh, and in, in that, in that way, actually, it's become a very interesting target for the pharmaceutical industry. A lot of big pharma companies have been trying to inhibit P38 MAP kinase and more recently MK2 as a way of developing anti-inflammatory drugs that, for, that might be useful for things like rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. Uh, uh, P38 MAP kinase inhibitors turned out, they have, there are some very specific inhibitors of, of MK2, and they've been around for a decade. They all flunked out in clinical trials because, uh, in preclinical testing, because animals became very susceptible to bacterial infection, which indicates the extreme importance of this amplification loop in, in host defense. So now the companies are sliding down scale and trying to make MK2 inhibitors, hoping there'll be more specificity, but I, I'm not sure that's ever going to come to pass. Nonetheless, uh, it's interesting in this context that a tumor, which is associated from its earliest moments, even before there's a mass, with a striking inflammatory state, uh, has a, a, a gene in it that can activate this pathway, or at least in principle can. Now, does it really activate this pathway, or am I just making this up? Uh, uh, the prediction would be that Kaposin B expression should upregulate uh, and st should stabilize ARE-containing messages and upregulate cytokine release. The way we assay that in culture as we make a chimeric uh, reporter gene, uh, uh, the globin gene, which either has or doesn't have a, a, an ARE from a, from a known gene, and then uh, transfect that into cells uh, 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 under the control of a, 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 a promoter that is turned off uh, by tetracycline. We allow constitutive expression, plus or minus Kaposin. Then we add tetracycline to specifically repress this gene and ask what happens to the half-life of the message. This is a much better way of doing the experiment than using actinomycin D, because you're not poisoning the entire transcriptome. You're just actually looking at the half-life of, of, of a message that does or doesn't have an ARE. And here's the result. Normal globin, of course, is a very stable, and its stability is not affected by Kaposin B. If you add an ARE, this one comes from GMCSF, but we've also done it with other AREs. You can see what Kamen described years ago. The message is very unstable. But now, if you express Kaposin B, 
uh, that, stable, that instability phenotype is, is very substantially, although not completely reversed. And consistent with that, uh, these cells produce more GMCSF, more IL-6, in the presence of Kaposin B. So it, it's clear that this is really an activator, not only in vitro, but in vivo. We don't know, actually to this day, exactly how Kaposin B turns on MK2. Uh, uh, when we map the binding site on MK2, it turns out to map to the a central region, which is where the catalytic domain is, which you know, initially made us think maybe this was going to be an inhibitor. But in fact, normally MK2, there's a crystal structure for the inactive form of MK2. And in that form, uh, a, an inhibitory loop from the C-terminus is folded back on the catalytic domain. So one possible mechanism for activation of MK2 by Kaposin is actually displacement of that inhibitory loop. That's our working model, but so far we've actually been unable to activate MK2 as a kinase in vitro with the purified component. So either this whole machine is much more complicated than we thought and involves other cellular uh, proteins, um, that's very likely, or we're just not good enough biochemists, that's equally likely. Okay. I want to close with a couple of more recent observations about other activities of Kaposin B. Because uh, there are two other activities, one related and one probably unrelated to what I've told you, uh, that are interesting in this regard. Um, I've told you that, ca that, that Kaposin B is involved in regulating uh, ARE containing message stability. This is a very complicated subject and poorly understood. But we do know that ARE containing, uh, these ARE elements are recognized by a whole series of proteins in, in cells. The AREs are themselves very degenerate, and a lot of the biochemistry that's been done on them isn't of very high quality. So as a result, there are about 14 known ARE binding proteins in the lexicon. A couple of these, however, are very well documented as likely to be involved. And one of them is a protein called TTP, tristetraproline, tris it stands for. Uh, this is a protein that can specifically bind AREs, and when when expressed exogenously, uh, uh, destabilizes AREs. It does so by triggering a deadenylation step uh, uh, from, from a nuclease called PARN, poly A ribonuclease, and that deadenylated 3' end uh, is then attacked by the exosome, a huge complex of uh, a bunch of different 3' to 5' exos that lead to degradation in this direction. There's recent evidence that this complex also can recruit and activate a, a big decapping complex that can trigger decapping and 5' to 3' exo function. Quite a complicated subject, understood much better in yeast than in mammalian cells. But TTP is an interesting protein to us because TTP is a known substrate for the kinase MK2. Okay? When, it, when, when TTP is phosphorylated by MK2, it, it, it creates a binding site for 14-3-3 proteins that blocks the recruitment of the exosome and the initiation of this degradative pathway. And there's very good mouse data that says that TTP is a very important uh, mediator functionally because uh, uh, Paul Anderson's lab at Harvard Med School has made knockout mice for uh, TTP, and they have a dramatic pro-inflammatory phenotype. They get spontaneous arthritis, dermatitis, and a whole bunch of other autoimmune diseases. They have extramedullary hematopoiesis from upregulation of GMCSF, just exactly the phenotype you would expect here. Um, so those two things, the fact that it's a target of MK2 and the fact that it's known to control these cytokine messages in vivo made us interested in TTP. Now, why would we be interested in TTP? We've already shown that Kaposin B can activate MK2. So you don't need to posit any further direct involvement between the viral genome and TTP to get the phenotype we're talking about. But we were impressed by the fact that, that Kaposin is a really weak activator of MK2. And it, one, you know, 3% the activity of the standard in vitro uh, stimuli that you give cells. And yet when we looked at the effect on message stability, it was just as potent as those more, more potent signals in stabilizing RNA. Now that doesn't prove anything, but it led us to an experiment that was kind of productive. It led us to ask whether Kaposin might have additional uh, impact downstream in the pathway at, at, around TTP. And that led us to a binding experiment, um, uh, which showed that recombinant TTP uh, was very efficient, would, would interact very efficiently with recombinant uh, Kaposin B, even when, when the two things were purified from E. coli. Uh, that there is a direct interaction, again, involving uh, mostly DR2, uh, uh, and this is a pretty efficient pulldown. This isn't one of these hokey pulldowns where they sh the, the starting lane is 1% of the input and you, and you get 10% of that in the precipitate. This is the input and this is what came down. Uh, and in fact, uh, this interaction also exists in cells that are expressing both proteins. We can do the co-IP in either direction and get 
uh, this interaction. And that makes us wonder whether Kaposin, in addition to be a scaffold on which MK2 is activated, might also deliver that, that active enzyme uh, to TTP in a concerted way. And this is why a modest activator of MK2 um, um, uh, you know, can have such a profound effect on, 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 on the stability of the, of the complex finally. All right, I wanna try to tell you one last thing, which illustrates how much we still have to learn about Kaposin. I promise this won't take long. Uh, but this is Hongru Lin, a postdoc who's been working, who's picked up this project. Uh, and Hongru noticed uh, that because of the uh, uh, proline richness of this complex, there are a lot of potential SH3 interaction motifs, PXXP being the sort of core uh, 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 of such a motif. Uh, there are a lot of potential PXXP sites in these repeats, and he began to wonder whether um, Kaposin might have other signaling activities um, that were based on protein-protein interactions. That led to a screen um, for interactions with known SH3 domains. Uh, it's possible now to obtain from commercial sources uh, uh, filters that have recombinant SH3 domains from many important signaling proteins deposited on them. And it's a simple matter to take a recombinant Kaposin B, toss it on this, and then using either an epitope tag Kaposin B, or now that we have good anti-Kaposin B serum, we can do this with the authentic serum. Uh, and this is what that looks like. It turns out a whole bunch of interesting signaling molecules will in vitro uh, interact with uh, Kaposin B. Now, don't get excited. We know that SH3 interactions with proline-rich domains are very easy to reproduce in culture, and only a minority of these are gonna turn out uh, to be true uh, in vivo. So Hongru then uh, asked how many of these candidate interactions could be verified uh, by a, a, an immunoprecipitation in an infected cell. And uh, this is uh, the short list. Everything in pink is what emerged as a positive. Oh, that didn't, we had a little uh, uh, glitch here. It's PLC gamma and VAV, cortactin and LCK. Now LCK is a T cell specific protein, so and we don't know of infection in T cells. Cortactin uh, involves the actin cytoskeleton to which I am profoundly allergic and therefore we're not working on it. Um, but VAV and PLC gamma were interesting because they are both important in a signal pa signaling pathway that's extremely important in the native reservoir of KSHV, which is the B cell. Uh, the B cell receptor signaling pathway involves PLC gamma and VAV very profoundly uh, and activates a series of um, downstream transcription factors, AP1, NFAT, and NF-kappa B. Interestingly enough, in the B cell, um, we see very efficient activation of BCR signaling following cross-linking uh, uh, when uh, Kaposin B is expressed. Um, uh, and the readout is on either AP1, as shown here, or uh, NFAT, as shown here. We see that the expression of Kaposin B in the presence of a BCR antibody cross-linking um, uh, leads to enhanced signaling. Um, uh, uh, from these two transcription factors. We haven't seen enhanced NF-kappa B activation, but certainly NFAT and AP1 are very strongly activated uh, downstream of the BCR. Now, what this means, I do not yet know. I just uh, put it up here as an indication that, that the full repertoire of things that the Kaposins can do is still not known, um, and we have a lot more to do. But I will point out uh, that this signaling pathway uh, downstream of the BCR is also downstream of many other growth factors that exist in endothelial cells. And so we're now trying to see um, if any of these interactions might be important in endothelial cell signaling, either in an autocrine or a paracrine way. So let me close um, by reminding you that KS is a triad of inflammation, angiogenesis, and proliferation, and that the, the spindle cell that's at the business end of KS both triggers and depends upon an inflammatory microenvironment. And consistent with that, two latent genes right into the, you know, that are expressed in every uh, spindle cell are potent inducers of inflammatory signaling, one by indu inducing transcription in an NF-kappa B dependent way, the other in stabilizing those, those, those uh, messages. In addition, one of these products also contributes to the, the shape change in endothelial cells. Um, and that Kaposin B has other activities that, that, uh, that can also affect other signaling processes that, that, that indicates we have a lot still to learn. But rather than just pretend that we understand everything, um, let's point out that, that implicit in everything I've told you today is a paradox, a really profound paradox. And that is that although we find it very satisfying as physicians that we can understand the pro-inflammatory phenotype now, uh, at least a little bit in KS, there's a deeper paradox here, which is why is KSHV involved to do this? 
If you teach virology, as I do, one of the things you spend time telling your students is that most viruses are making things that block, suppress, nullify these inflammatory or immune uh, 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 complexes. The pox viruses make a whole bunch of proteins, secrete, secreted chemokine and cytokine binding factors, soluble receptor analogs that act um, like etanercept to block these pathways. Um, and that's because viral evolution is driven by one thing and one thing only, and that is spread. Spread from cell to cell, person to person, and population to population. That and only that drives viral evolution. Disease, sorry to tell you oncologists, is a sideshow. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, um, but it's a sideshow in viral evolution. So why has the virus evolved to do this? It's, it's a bit of a mystery. We have to assume uh, that inflammatory microenvironment somehow promotes KSHV replication and spread. And thinking about that is leading us to a new generation of experiments trying to understand that. We have no clue what that's about, uh, but I think this is a very interesting question, and, and in the solution to this, we're going to learn a lot about the biology of KSHV. I'll stop there and uh, apologize for going a little bit over time, um, and be happy to take questions if you have the stomach for it. It is, on the other hand, lunchtime. Don, um, what is the impact on a molecular or mechanistic level of immunosuppression conferred by HIV, and is it replicated by immunosuppressive drugs in patients who, say, have organ transplantation? Uh, the answer to the second question is more or less yes. Um, uh, so KS does exist among the immunosuppressed, uh, among the iatrogenically immunosuppressed. Post-transplant KS is a well-known problem. Um, in parts of Italy, it's the number one tumor after transplantation, and that's because Italy is an endemic zone for KS. So KSHV infection in the States is relatively uncommon. One, two, three percent of the general population is seropositive. In southern Italy, Sicily, and Sardinia, 25 percent of the population is seropositive. And that's a place where infrastructure exists for renal transplantation. After renal transplantation on Sardinia, something like seven to 10 percent of people will get KS, overt KS. Um, Post-transplant KS is not quite as bad as the AIDS-related form, but it tends to be more widely disseminated, uh, have visceral involvement, um, and all the, all the features that we don't like to see. How do people manage post-transplant KS? Well, in the old days, one managed it by reducing immunosuppression, uh, trying to lower the dose of cyclosporin or, or, um, or uh, uh, help me here, uh, mycophenolate. Uh, uh, and if you do that and try to find a level that, the, that will allow the patient to keep on having a kidney, although their creatinines often rise into the twos, uh, what, you, what would happen is the KS would arrest. 20% of the lesions would disappear. The remainder would simply arrest as a dermal spot and, and, and not cause the patient any trouble. However, it wasn't always possible to reduce the immunosuppressive. If the person already had chronic rejection, they would lose the kidney. The new development here, and this is a nice illustration of why it pays to pay attention to medicine if you're in this game, um, uh, is that in an attempt to deal with post-transplant KS, a group of physicians in Italy uh, began treating people with rapamycin, began substituting rapamycin for cyclosporin. Rapamycin, as you may know, is much less potent as an immunosuppressive than cyclosporin, but is not inactive in that regard. Uh, and when they did that, they, they published a series of 19 out of 19 patients had the lesion completely involute, okay? Now, it, that experiment doesn't tell us whether the reduction in immunosuppression was, was what was going on, but that is a much more dramatic result than anyone ever achieved by dialing down cyclosporin before, okay? Uh, I think it means that the mTOR signaling pathway is very centrally involved here somehow, um, and that is now occupying two of my postdocs, trying to figure out what does mTOR signaling do? Uh, rapamycin is a weak inhibitor of KSHV lytic replication. Um, uh, it reduces viral yields about two to three-fold. I don't know that that has anything to do with uh, the phenotype. Uh, we've got a few tentative indications that rapamycin also reduces in a, in a, in a, uh, the growth rate of latently infected cells in a fashion that appears to depend upon the viral genome. So that's interesting, and we're trying to figure it out. All this is pretty soft. But so is immunosuppression just simply uh, more permissive for KSHV yeah. replication, so, or yeah. are there T cell derived issues okay. as well? You mentioned so the there are two schools of thought about what what HIV does to AIDS, uh, to to KS. Um, one is that it's all just immunosuppression, and this is the school of thought that I adhere to. Um, that you can understand all the effects of uh, of HIV on KS by imagining that AIDS does 
to KSHV, what it does to every other herpes viral infection of human being, which is to cause you to lose control of the lytic cycle. So patients who have HIV in general have higher viral loads for KSHV, which reflects lytic replication, uh, and, and, and those higher viral loads predict an increased risk of developing KS. Um, patients who have severe end-stage HIV and are put on gancyclovir for other reasons experience a six-fold decline in incident KS. Uh, and gancyclovir is an inhibitor of lytic KSHV replication, does nothing to latency. So these are things that make you believe that lytic infection has something profound to do with KS, and loss of control of the lytic infection conversely creates risk. That is all that is necessary to explain the cyclosporin data, the AIDS data. Now, that's not to say that it proves that that's all there is to it. Bob Gallo and uh, Barbara Ensley still believe very strongly that there's a direct genetic contribution of HIV to this lesion, even though HIV is not present in KS itself. Okay? They believe that the cytokine microenvironment created by by HIV infection is, is permissive for KS, and that may well be so. They specifically believe that soluble TAT is a growth factor for KS spindle cells. That's based on a whole bunch of in vitro experiments that sadly are, are difficult to tie to the real biology of KS. Why? Because when spindle cells are grown in culture, absent a selection, as, as Bill alluded to, they lose the KSHV episodes. So every single line that Gallo derived uh, uh, has actually lost the KSHV genome. Uh, so showing that TAT causes them to grow uh, doesn't convince me that the TAT really is a growth factor for the authentic spindle cell in vivo. That's the state of play. Those are the arguments that are out there. Uh, we may never know how this really works, absent an animal model. If KS patients are treated with anti-inflammatory drugs, what's the response? Because that uh, helps answer your question well, at the end. Well, the problem is that anti-inflammatory drugs all have their own targets, uh, and inflammation is a big subject. There are lots of players. So I, I don't know that there is any decisive test that can be done with a drug. No one has ever given an anti-TNF drug uh, to an AIDS patient because we already know, and nobody ever will in Africa because of the TB risk of doing such a thing. Um, uh, so I, I don't think there's been an inhibitor approach to that, that question. Uh, Don. Oh. Um, you said you can't get immortalization of B cells with this virus, um, but based on your last slide, have you tried activating either through the BCR or CD40 or toll receptor yeah. in the presence of infection? And yeah, see what you're touching you on do? a really interesting question. Here's a dirty little secret that is rarely acknowledged in public. We all know that KSHV is a B lymphotropic virus. If you look at a healthy seropositive, the only place you can find virus is in B cells. However, most B cell lines in culture can't even be infected with KSHV, okay? Although I emphasize that any adherent line we want can be infected, including mouse cells, we can't get KSHV into most B cells in culture. The, there is an exception to that, and two groups, one in Pittsburgh and one in our group in San Francisco, have been, have been looking at primary B cells in culture. Uh, primary resting B cells from the peripheral blood cannot be infected. If they're activated with IL-4 and CD40 ligand, um, they can be infected in culture. And we found that tonsils from, that are taken out from kids with tonsillectomy uh, can be infected directly without any further activation stimulus, although those tonsils are already enlarged, hyperactive, okay? So B cell activation is required for infection in culture. Um, however, and we can get pretty good infection uh, in culture that way. However, and, and there is, a, uh, there is we've found, a small survival advantage to an infected B cells. Infected B cells survive about seven or eight days longer than uninfected B cells. But they are not immortalized, they will ultimately give up the ghost. Um, and, and no matter what we do to them, TNF, LPS, CD40 ligand, nothing immortalizes them. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Don. Um, we're gonna break for lunch. Uh, lunch for those of you